Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so presenting with me today is Alex Tesh, and uh, my name's Anthony Reese. And today we're going to uh, take you through uh, some of the use cases uh, that we built for a customer of ours based uh, in Australia, um, and, um, and some of the enhancements that we, we did um, utilizing OpenStack with Ansible. Um, most of the use cases that we'll be going through today will be Neutron based. Um, so hands up um, anyone in the room who has had a customer or even uh, a work colleague come up to them and say, hey, I've been reading um, about this Gartner bi bimodal IT and uh, we really want to do something about it and we've got all these legacy systems and now we also want to be able to start using code to be able to transform our, our business and to be able to leverage OpenStack in, in some particular way. If, has anyone had a customer or even a, yep, a couple of hands going up around the room? Um, well, this exact same thing happened to us, and uh, I'll admit, um, in about September of last year, um, I looked at my colleague Alex, and Alex looked at me, and we went, mm, what's this bimodal IT thing? Um, and from there, um, and then from there, um, a set of use cases um, developed, and um, we went on a bit of a journey of learning, and hopefully what we'll be able to do today is to be able to pass um, some of that learning onto you. Um, not only will we talk about um, what worked really well, but we're also going to highlight um, a number of the uh, the distinct uh, challenges, yes. the challenges yep, yes. around um, around working with uh, some of the examples that we've created, and also um, some areas where uh, the solution is quite mature, um, but also other areas where you're going to identify, and we're going to call out to you hopefully pretty much all of the pitfalls that we came across and some of the issues that you'll. Uh, that you'll come across if you're trying to do similar use cases as well. So uh, this afternoon, what we're going to take you through is um, we'll start off with load balancer as a service. Uh, so we'll talk you through what the customer was trying to achieve there. Uh, we'll go straight into a live demo. Uh, so everything that we're doing today is live demonstration. Uh, and then from there, we'll move into firewall as a service, uh, talk you through uh, what we were trying to achieve out of, out of that. Uh, working next into uh, VPN as a service with an, another live demonstration. Uh, so we'll actually be joining two OpenStack clouds together. Um, and we'll also talk uh, a little bit about backend as a service in that particular area too. And the last example um, with a live demonstration will be bare metal. So bare metal provisioning as a service, uh, utilizing Ansible for that. We'll take you through that. We'll talk you through um, the different playbooks, um, how it works. Um, and we'll kick that off. Probably won't have time for that to finish because it does take a little while to run, um, but we're happy to take questions afterwards once we get through those. So four live demonstrations um, that we'll, we'll be moving through this afternoon. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I think we're crazy to try this, but anyway. All right, load balancer as a service. Should we get started on it? Let's do it. Okay, load balancer as a service. Uh, so as I alluded to before, uh, this enterprise-based customer of ours uh, was, was or already has uh, a large uh, legacy um, set of systems. Uh, they've got in excess of around about five to 600 applications, uh, disparate applications that they have running in legacy environments. And they've been playing around with AWS for quite some time. But um, they're, of course, uh, they're, they're, they're in the finance, financial and banking um, Area, so of course they've got they've got a couple of issues around data sovereignty and also the ability for them to be able to um, meet the regulatory um, requirements of the country. So uh, they wanted to be able to test out um, auto scaling um, via threshold, and they also wanted to be able to support a number of different load balancers as well. So what we did was we put together um, a. Uh, we put together a, a, a framework for them to be able to utilize. Um, this particular framework is centered around LBAS2 uh, in this particular case. Um, but we'll talk you through some of the challenges that we had around that, and especially as we're going through, through the demo, um, to be able to get that to proactively scale as, as well. So they wanted to be able to integrate that with auto-scaling too. Um, and all in all, they wanted to be able to control everything by code. So they wanted to be able to use similar load balances they were using uh, in their, their legacy type environment and do exactly the same thing uh, within their, their new mode two area, as they would call it from Gartner. So with that, I think we'll jump across to, the, to our first demo. Thank you, Anthony. Yes, what I will do first is let me 
kick off the demo for a while, and then we go into the challenges that we face it. All right, so what I will do is I'm going to connect to our uh, jumping host, which is currently sitting in Sydney, and um, I will trigger the very first use case, which is basically Elbus. So like Anthony mentioned, basically this customer, they wanted to achieve quite a, a good amount of SDN use cases. And um, the funny thing is that initially we pulled New Ash as well. So New Ash was actually playing closely with us. We managed to create a playbooks to integrate New Ash with our own Helium OpenStack distribution. And uh, there were long nights, right, they Anthony? Were. So basically we spent a couple of long nights working with the folks from New Ash in Sydney. And um, suddenly after we got that portion working, turns out that there is no budget to bring New Ash into the POC. So we have to figure out how to redo it again, basically just using pure Neutron. So all the use cases that we have here to there is basically based in uh, OpenStack Neutron, all right? There is no DCN, there is no new ash, sadly. We're hoping that for the next customer, that will be the case. Yep. All right, so we can see from here, from Horizon, that basically we have just a, uh, the font size, all right, for the console. Yeah, let me give it a try. Let's make it 18. Is this better? Sure. A bit? Okay. All right, cool. We'll, we'll translate as we're going through as well. Yeah, later we will go into the challenges, but basically we scripted everything on. Um, We're going to run this script, which basically starts calling a heat template, a heat orchestration template that we have running in this environment. Um, and basically what this one does is it will start to stand up database network. We have a DMZ network as well. And this customer, like Anthony mentioned, they were looking into mode two. So it's not really a cloud-based kind of application. They were actually having some backend applications that we wanted to migrate into the cloud, and they say, look, Gartner said that Mo2 can also be ported into OpenStack, so you guys have to give it a try. So that's what we did, right? And basically, this is not exactly the same infrastructure that they were running at the time, but we tried to emulate roughly the same, just to give you a rough idea, right? So what we have here at the moment is we have two web servers. They are actually Tomcat servers. We are going to see the load balancer in front of them. In this case, we're using HA proxy, so we are using the native Neutron APIs for that. Um, of course, this was mostly on development and QA stage. They just wanted to give it a try, see the behavior. For production, they were actually going to integrate with the five, right, make use of some production load balancers. Okay, while well, this one is running, which is going to take about two more minutes, let's talk a bit about the limitations. Okay, uh, how many of you guys tried before the uh, LBAS using Silometer for the scaling groups? So as you may know, in, uh, in HEAT, uh, basically when you define the scaling groups, you can define thresholds. And once you hit the threshold for your web farm, let's say we define it at 80% CPU utilization, then the scalability group will kick in and hopefully it will trigger the scaling, bring a new web server into the farm and, um, and basically just put it as a member of the load balancer and everything should be fine. However, having said that, Sinometer has quite a few known issues. There are some instances in which the utilization is quite high, actually, for your web farm, and Silometer just didn't kick, kick, kick in the auto-scaling group. That's very often. So what we are trying to achieve in uh, Helion OpenStack at the moment is we are limiting the scope of Silometer just for billing purposes, okay? We track the utilization of whatever instances that you have running in the cloud, but we only use Silometer basically to track and build. That's all. Uh, fortunately, we are working in a project on Monasca. I don't know if you heard about it. Basically, it means uh, monitoring as a service at scale. And the scoop of Monasca is basically monitor the instances and make sure that we can trigger this, this auto-scaling, right? Okay, no HA capabilities for LBAS version two is exactly the same issue that we have with version one, right? So basically, the load balancer is running as a namespace in uh, either the compute node, if we are using DVR, or the network controllers. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, is it not connected to the SMT? Like having to go to Mataka does. 
Okay, yeah. yeah we'll talk about so that. the question is, in the previous session, they were talking about Mitaka and uh, the integration with Silometer, was it? And the new project that they are working on? It's coming, it's definitely coming. Look, there are quite a number of improvements happening in Mitaka. Sadly, or I shouldn't say sadly, because actually it's a good thing for the enterprises, the commercial distributions, the ones that are enterprise grade and, and ready for production, are uh, behind the cycle that is happening upstream, right? And it's usually between three to six months, the, the gap that we have, all right? We have people like Marantis, which are very efficient, just releasing uh, very close to upstream. Uh, in the case of Helion OpenStack, actually this week we are releasing Helion OpenStack 3.0, and that one is going to be based on Liberty. So again, whatever improvement that is going on at the moment in Mitaka is going to be likely ported over in 4.0. So it's getting there, but it's not as close as upstream as what you may like, all right? So again, this is your challenges from the operational side. May not apply for Mitaka itself, but it's how we address them in this case using OpenStack 2, which is based on Kilo. All right, so we are a bit behind. Okay, so you may know that if we are using uh, basically kernel name spaces for the load balancer, the moment that either your network node dies or their compute node dies, basically your load balancer is gone, right? So that's a limitation that we have. This is actually been addressed in the next release, Liberty Base, with something that we call Octavia. Okay, so basically Octavia is going to be an actual virtual machine which is going to be acting as a load balancer, and there is going to be HA capabilities. So hopefully when the network node goes down or the compute node goes down with DVR, then we should be able to migrate the Octavia to another node, and your load balancer will continue to work in a seamless fashion. And the last section really is around um, uh, this particular version didn't have, does not have Horizon uh, integration, so uh, you can't see uh, the Albas uh, being spawned within uh, uh, but shown within the Horizon interface. To me, that's not really a big issue um, because you can, you can still do it um, through command line, um, so which is fine from my perspective. But uh, the particular customer that we were dealing with, they wanted to be able to see everything from a single pane of glass. So there's a little bit of a challenge there uh, from their perspective. Uh, I don't think most people in the room are gonna see there's a massive negative, but that's okay. Um, and then the last, uh, the last issue was around Aldas V2 um, at that particular time uh, with heated integration. Uh, we all know it's coming, um, so which is good. But uh, at that, that stage, uh, we had to go down the Ansible, the Ansible path because uh, the heat integration uh, isn't there. Uh, so this was the workaround that we came in uh, to be able to do it. Let's take a look how our demo is going. Um, Right, I think it's up and running. So like Anthony mentioned, look, if you go to the network tab here, you won't be able to see LBAS. And the reason for it is LBAS version two, no integration at the moment as of Kilo. Liberty, I understand it won't be there either, at least in our commercial release, it's supposed to happen in Mitaka, hopefully. So not a big deal. Again, this particular customer, they were very keen to do infrastructure as code and everything is supposed to be driven via APIs or command line, so it's not actually a big issue there. Okay, so let's take a look at the actual script that was supposed to stand up the infra, and hopefully we should be able to see from here the floating address for our so-called load balancer. Uh, let me close this tab. Let's just try to paste it. And uh, in this particular case, we're using Tomcat. The port that we are using in the load balancer is 8080. And if everything goes smooth, we should be able to see from the, that would be your left side, the connectivity to the database, all right? So all these fields that are coming from this side are actually coming from the backend, which is actually running Oracle Express Edition, okay? That was the instance that we spun it on the DB segment. So um, how to test the round robin? Because this thing is supposed to be working in a round robin fashion. Again, I am using forms here. So this particular font may not get the updates from the second load balancer. So what we can do is we can actually call the IP address So the, the load just balancer. Using, the load balancer is just a round robin, so we yep. should see it's just toggling between the two, web one, web two, web one, web two. Yeah, that's right. So it's supposed to work in a round robin fashion. Uh, let's talk a bit about uh, what we call proactive scaling, okay? Like Anthony mentioned before, there is no integration yet with heat and Elbas version two, 
So by right, accelerometer cannot really work with autoscaling groups, which is actually a good thing because it doesn't work most of the time anyway. So what we did in this particular case, the customer was using OpenView, which is an enterprise monitoring tool. So we get OpenView to monitor the actual load in the instances and just trigger our proactive scaling scripts, right? So we just tell them to call, uh, let's say, scale up. We go back to our network tab, and we should be able to see that a new instance is starting to, to come up. So this is called scale web one. So again, if we want to use a pure OpenStack solution, what would be the way to do it? So ideally, we wouldn't be relying on enterprise tools, monitoring tools in order to achieve this. Okay, the good point is that in Monasca, I don't know if there were quite a few Monasca sessions during the summit. I don't know if you have the chance to attend it, but basically they mentioned that we can enable some alarms, we can create our own alarms, and we can actually monitor the load in the instances running inside the cloud, all right? So we should be able to create the triggers as well, and basically, based on events, call the scripts and do what we call proactive scaling. So again, all of this is trying to bypass the limitations that we're facing with the current release. And this particular customer was using third-party monitoring tools, um, which they wanted to be able to continue to use no matter what resource pool they were, consume, they, were, um, they were monitoring. So what we did was we actually tied into those and we were able to do proactive scaling and scale down uh, based on the monitoring tools that they are already utilizing um, and basically just hitting the API from there to be able to get the responses. That's right. Let's see if our new Tomcast server is up. It seems to be there. Sorry about the resolution once more. Let's just clear this. And let's try to test our advancer again. Hopefully we should see a third web server, which is a scale web one. All right, so seems to be working fine. Anthony, do you want to talk more about the firewall as a service? We would be the next one. Yep. Okay, so the next, the next um, live demo that we'll go through is firewall as a service. Um, what we were basically looking, what we were asked to achieve here was to be able to create uh, a, dynamic, uh, a, dyna a dynamic firewall for their POC environment uh, to allow them to be able to, uh, to block ports or to be able to um, create security profiles. And what they were looking to be able to do is to be able to control that via code. So uh, at particular runtime, uh, they use a lot of continuous integration. Um, in this particular environment, they had a Jenkins rig that was running. And at runtime, th what they wanted to be able to do was to inject into the IaaS layer uh, the policies to be applied for uh, the tiered architecture that they were going and standing up. And what we were able to do was to be able to give them um, via API in this particular case, and this is the demonstration that we'll do, um, although there is integration at the horizon um, level, and we'll show you that uh, before we start. Don't forget to do that. Um, and uh, once, once the rig was, was initiated, uh, the code is obviously uh, then pushed uh, to the platform as the infrastructure is being stood up and uh, the security policies uh, are injected at runtime. So what we do is we'll give you a, a demonstration of those security policies uh, that were being um, literally injected um, and we'll show you how they, how they run and, um, and what, they, what they look like uh, from the Horizon portal and what they look like from the command line as well. Right, let's go back to our network tabs. Let's check the firewall as a service, and there is nothing up the sleeves, right? So we don't have anything at the moment. Okay, so this is by no means a replacement of an enterprise firewall. So what we are using, again, is basically the firewall as a service, which is provided by, by Neutron. And what I will do is a very simple test case. I will take a look at the IP address that we are running for the load balancer. In this case, it's 202.33. And let's just try to ping it from, from this console. Okay, I can actually ping it. So the customer was a bit concerned about this. They said, look, uh, you know, have you heard about denial of service and this kind of stuff? You can actually ping it from many sites and suddenly it will go down. So we are a bit, a bit uneasy with this implementation. And the sad thing is that we cannot really control ICMP by using security groups in the load balancer, right? Because this floating IP is actually sitting in the load balancer. The load balancer is not an actual instance, at least not until we get to Octavia. And uh, then the only way that we really have to block this ICMP from within OpenStack is actually enable firewall as a service. So let me go to case three. 
and what I will do is just call this particular script and we will see that basically I am starting to deny it. I'm creating some rules to deny the ICMP and to still a labor or allow the traffic going to IT80, which is our tongue server, right? Uh, let's go back to Horizon. Let's take a look at the firewalls and hopefully we should have a firewall which has two policies in place, one for deny ICMP, one for allow HTTP, and these are the rules. All right, let's try to ping it again. Where's my ping? Here. All right. <coughs> Two out of four. It's working fine so far. <laughs> hey, don't jinx this. <laughs> okay, uh, let's get Anthony to talk a bit about uh, VPN as a service. Or let me see, I think we have some limitations that we want to highlight about this yeah, particular use case. There's a couple of use, um, limitations we need to talk about. Yeah, well, like we mentioned, is by no means a replacement of an enterprise firewall. They are APIs in place for major vendors like Shapepoint, in which we can integrate with Neutron. So that's the ideal for case for production environments. All right, again, this is only QA and development. So it's just for testing purposes. The second issue is if DVR is enabled, which in our case it is because it's the default in Helium OpenStack, then uh, it's not going to filter the east-west traffic. It's only going to filter the north-south, right? So any traffic coming from, from outside. So again, in this particular case, a combination of security groups for the particular Tomcat instance, let's say, and a firewall as a service to basically block the ICMP in the load balancer, that would be the ideal situation, or at least that's the way that we present it to this customer. All right. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what we mentioned before. Let's jump into the, what I believe is the most interesting use case, which is VPN as a service. Anthony will talk a little bit more about this requirement from the customer. Okay, so uh, VPN as a service was was interesting to uh, to the customer that we were working with uh, for a number of reasons. Probably the biggest the biggest reason that they were um, they were interested in it and um, and they wanted to see how to be able to uh, to connect two uh, OpenStack clouds in this particular instance together uh, was because uh, the, like I like I alluded to before they were utilizing uh, quite a bit of public cloud uh, but because of the regulatory issues that they had um, and a number of the monolithic databases that they have sitting at the back end, they wanted to be able to have their private cloud environment be able to hook up to either um, alternate private cloud environments or um, even look to be able to hook up to public clouds um, in the future, but still be able to have their uh, databases um, located where they, where they are at the moment um, and have them um, securely uh, securely left in the, in the locations and the data centers that they are at the moment, where, where, they, where they currently were, were residing. Uh, they have a number of Oracle uh, Teradata uh, databases, for, for example, um, so systems of record, massive systems of record, and a lot of these um, are, need to be ma made available to the digital groups that need to be able to consume them. And this is one way that they were looking at to be able to do that, so literally to be able to link two clouds together um, to be able to do proof of concepts on uh, whether they can be able to ship information uh, from one legacy environment across to what they were calling their bimodal new world, uh, so to speak, um, and allow the legacy groups still to be able to continue on uh, working on uh, the solutions uh, and, the, and the, the platforms that they were that they were currently utilizing in, in, their, in their legacy um, environments, uh, but also allow their digital teams to be able to move faster and be able to still get to that information at the back end. So to describe it um, at a very, very high level, uh, we've essentially got two OpenStack clouds running. And those two clouds, uh, one of the clouds we, we will show um, having the, uh, the, web, the web servers uh, sitting in. And in the second site, so site, site A in this particular case, um, we've got the database located. So it's a pretty simple uh, two-tier architecture in this particular case. Um, we've got We've got a small um, Oracle data database uh, on site A and on site B, uh, Tomcat, uh, with, a set of, uh, uh, with a set of web pages um, he heading on it. And what we're going to do is show you that uh, they can't talk to each other. And then when we enable uh, VPN as a service uh, via code, uh, which we can also de-enable uh, via code as well, uh, you'll then be able to get to the database and retrieve the information. 
All right, there are a few discrepancies between our actual demo environment and what the customer used to have at that time. Uh, this spoke actually happened in January, and at that time we still have our defunct Helium public cloud, which is based in OpenStack. So at that time, some of the workloads that they plan to run, we actually tested on the public cloud, right, based on OpenStack. And the web farm was basically sitting there, so ideally the database will be kept on premise. Uh, they don't want the data sitting God knows where. So that was the whole idea they have in mind, right? So let me go back to the environment, um, which is here. And what we do now is let me just, I think I may need to re-log in again to this particular second cloud. Both of these clouds in this case are sitting in the same data center in Sydney, but they are isolated clouds. So we have two separate Helion OpenStack implementations, right? I'm going to log in as the VPN tenant for this particular cloud. And if we go to the network topology, we should be able to see that this one is only running the, the web services, the Tomcat, right? So Tomcat is here. Let's take a look at the other cloud. Let me get out from this tenant. And let's quickly go into my VPN tenant. And this guy should be running our database. Okay, two isolated clouds, one running the backend, the other one running the web services. So this is a slightly simpler use case in terms of the infrastructure. I don't have a load balancer sitting in front, so what I will do is I should be able to actually hit the floating IP from the web server itself, <coughs> which is the one that we have over here. Let me just copy over. I'm going to create this tab. Let's open a new one. And again, port 8080 for Tomcat. And there you go, we are getting some JSP errors. And the reason for this is, like I mentioned before, on this side, we have actually the database connectivity, right, which is being pulled from our backend. We have no backend connectivity at the moment. This one we can actually double check it from, uh, from the Neutron tab. We should be able to see the VPN tab here, and there is no policies, and there is no IPsec side connection, all right? So let me try to enable it for this particular tenant. Now, once enabled, we should be able to go back to that web page and the JSP errors should disappear because it should now have a database that it can talk to if, if it works. All right. Let's just give it a few seconds. Cool. Let's try to refresh our horizon first. Let me just make sure that we have an IP link. It seems to be active. The IP policies are in place. And uh, let's try to refresh this guy. We have a database now. Okay, so basically we just created the tunnel between the on-premise cloud and the public one. Okay, no, not a big challenge there. Still, we have quite a number of limitations, which I want to cover now. And uh, yeah, basically this doesn't work with DVR. Okay, if we want to run this implementation and DVR is enabled, which basically will put the floating IP on the compute side, we should have an FIP running as a name pace in the compute node itself the implementation is not going to work. And the reason is because there is still no integration with VPN and, uh, and the DVR. This is going to happen hopefully in our next release. Yeah, I think that release. a lot of work was done in Liberty, so hopefully that won't be a challenge. So what we have to do for this particular tenant is the moment that we create the router that is going to have the, the IPsec link between the two sides, we have to create it as a centralized virtual router. Okay, that was one of the limitations. Again, no big deal. The only problem is, as you know, the FIP will be sitting on the network controller, so all the traffic will travel through the computers to the network and then outside. So it's just a single point of contagion. The second challenge, and which is perhaps more worrying, is that uh, the, the current implementation that we have for VPN as a service is based on what we call pre-share keys. So basically, we just define a word that we're going to use, and that word is going to serve as the seed for the encryption and it has to be the same on both clouds. So it's not precisely the safest of implementations, but it works, all right, which is the important thing. And the last implementation, Ooh. Helion OpenStack is still based on OpenSwan for the VPN implementation, and OpenSwan happens to be run as root. So not to worry you too much, but at the moment there are no, no holes, no, no bugs that we know 
of that we are aware of, but as you know, if, if there is an exploit or opens one and is running as road, it's not that difficult actually to get a root chain in your machine, right? So yeah, there should be a concern. We reckon that. Uh, again, there is work taking place at the moment in the community, so hopefully there will be a stronger implementation in the future. Yeah, just to be clear on, on the OpenSwan um, challenge, <laughs> let's call it that, um, the financial institution that we were working with, even though it was a POC, in, a POC environment, they appreciated being able to control uh, VPN as a service by a code, uh, but that was seen as, a, as quite a large security hole. So please keep that one in mind, all right? It's good for POCs, good for demos, but yeah. Back end as a service. Bare metal as a service. Bare metal, bare metal, yes. All right, do you want to talk about this particular customer? Okay. Um, so this is, this is our final um, live demo. And bare metal as a service uh, was interesting to the customer because they, they have a lot of challenges. Um, number one, actually time to market. So even being able to, uh, to deploy um, into their particular environment would, would take uh, quite, quite a substantial amount of time, let alone if they need to go to bare metal. Um, and to be brutally honest, if they've deployed into a, into a virtual, like, virtualized cloud um, set of instances, taking it from a set of cloud instances and then deploying it onto bare metal um, after having already pushed into a virtualized environment took them four times longer. And even working out how to be able to cut across from that was, uh, was, was a policy nightmare within that particular organization. So what they're really interested in here was really bare metal in, in two ways. Um, so what they wanted to be able to do was, yeah, can we actually in increase uh, the amount of compute nodes in an automated way to be able to increase the size of our environments? But number two, can we come up with, uh, with a methodology to have a singular framework uh, in terms of scripts to be able to deploy into uh, an environment which is uh, running on OpenStack, but can we also do the same thing, provision um, bare metal and deploy onto bare metal as well um, using a very similar set of code? And this is what they asked us to be able to prove. It was pretty challenging, um, I must admit, but... Um, well, the good thing is that in our distro, we already have all the playbooks in place for this kind of situation. So ideally, it's just as simple as dropping a new server in your rack, taking out of the MAC address, just defining the model for this particular new compute and just run the playbook and it should work fine, right? So one of the main things that we are trying to address here with Ansible is basically what we call HLM, the Helium Lifecycle Manager. If we have the same conversation with this customer one year back, it would be a totally different one. Let's try to go back in time to our Helium OpenStack 1 release, which was basically based on triple O, such a wonder. And, um, and the conversation basically will go, okay guys, I want to upgrade today or I want to patch my cloud. Let's say I am sitting in Juno, which is the case of our previous distribution and I want to migrate to let's say Kilo or Liberty. How do I go about it? So basically the conversation was, well, you stand a new cloud. You stand a new cloud based on Liberty and then we start moving workloads, which is perhaps not the ideal situation, right? So with these Ansible playbooks, what we're trying to do is to make a seamless experience for the customer when it comes to migrating across cycles, all right? And, uh, make it seamless for the workloads, so the end user shouldn't be affected. Let's take a look at uh, one of the playbooks that we have here, for example. I'm going to jump into this particular server, and uh, what I will do is I'm going to check how many systems I currently have inside Cobbler. So for HLM, we have basically quite a few components. Our repositories are held in Cobbler, which is, of course, open source. And uh, in Cobbler, we also hold the definitions on how many computes we have in this particular cloud at the moment. So I only happen to have one, which is Compute2. I create already the definition in the model, which is uh, sitting sitting in this particular directory, and what I will do is just call my playbook to try to update Cobbler and inform him that there is a new compute node coming into the cloud. Uh, 
Okay, this playbook is going to run for about a minute, and uh, hopefully after this is finished, when we check the cobbler again, we should be able to see an additional compute node. In the meantime, let me check, we're going to connect to our ILO in this particular HP machine. I need to use Internet Explorer for that. This is the most boring use case. That's why there is people walking out. <laughs> All right, the machine is currently down. So I only it's have the option to momentary press, which is your favorite button, right, to power on the machine. It I'm is. not going to do that. Hopefully my playbook is going to take care of everything. Okay, so this went wrong without any issues. Let's check over again. And we can see now two compute nodes. So let's try to power on this baby. And for that, I have created a script which basically is calling a playbook again. And that one is sitting in case bare metal. We call it ray image. So basically what this one will do is it's going to power on my machine. Uh, in Ansible, we are making calls to uh, IPMI tools. And basically using IPMI tools, we just control the booting, rebooting of the machines. And we can also set and configure the pixie boot and which one is the interface that is going to pixie boot to grab all the binaries from, from our repos, right? Sitting on the on the cobbler machine. Okay, so hopefully this guy is going to power off. Let me just get rid of this uh, slip condition. Control C to continue. Powering it now down, it's already down. So let's continue. And if we're successful, we should see that other server start the pixie. Yeah, we should. Okay, now this sleep condition is going to be there until this machine actually powers on. Which is happening, we can see more options here, so that means that it's actually coming up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, again, the installation is going to take about 20 to 30 minutes, which I don't think we have the time. Actually, we have. We are the last session, but I don't think you want to see it anyway. Um, I don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so what I will do instead is let me walk you to some of the slides, and we will basically explain how the model works. This is how the Ansible model works, okay? We basically create the definitions on this particular find for all your environment. So all the computes are basically here all your BSAs, in case that you are using BSA as a cinder backend, are here, or if you have a three-part definition, it's also here. Your controller definition is sitting here as well, so everything is basically YAML defined in the Ansible model, okay? So what we do is basically, the very first time that I run the Cobbler playbook, is going to create the repositories holding our hlinux distribution, which is the one that we use for Helion OpenStack, and it's also going to configure the hcp.conf, right? So basically, we're going to provide the MAC address of that particular machine, the IP address that we want to use, and everything is, is basically seamless to the user. So the only thing that we need to worry about is logging the server in the rack, taking note of the MAC address, and updating this particular model, okay? Okay, so what we did just now, the last playbook that, that I run, which is called Reimage, is basically making a few calls to ICMP, uh, to the IPMI tools, all right, to get in the machine boot. We are not using Ironic at the moment. Perhaps that will come in the future, but at the moment we, we think that ICMP tools is, is good enough for what we want to achieve. So the moment that this machine actually starts booting, which is going to take a while, it will go into Pixie Boot, all right? It will grab the Pixie Boot interface and we will start to get the binaries for our HLinux distribution loaded already in the machine. Step number two, after we have the machine running with the operating system, is basically run another set of playbooks which is basically going to bring the machine inside as a Nova compute inside our cloud. And that's pretty much what we do for bare metal as a service at the moment. All right, guys. All right. I think that's all we have. That's but if it. If you have any additional questions. For demos and yeah, we'll be, I will leave this guy running. We'll be here for any questions um, afterwards, but I think we're out of time. So um, thank you very much for, for attending. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming. Cheers.